Like no other disease, the plague inspires terror in human beings. In the 14th century, one of the most lethal illnesses in human history killed about one-third of Europe's population. Apparently, smallpox is still thought to be the most dangerous bioweapon on the planet, more so than Ebola, because it's far more contagious, and it is thought to be already in the hands of the bad guys. Which is why I invited Richard Preston here. He just flew in from New York. He's a best-selling author who writes about infectious disease epidemics and bioterrorism. He questions our preparedness and seeks ways to protect civilian populations against outbreaks of unparalleled horror. Richard. Moses, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm glad I could make it on time. Uh, I jotted down a few little notes here, but I have no idea if I'm actually going to refer to them or not. Um, I want to show you uh, some pictures and talk with you about one of the most um, profoundly important phenomena in nature, at least from the point of view of the human species and its biological future. And this is the trans-species jump of a virus um, or a parasite. A virus is um, an extremely small life form um, that's an obligate parasite. It can only make copies of itself inside the cells of a living organism. A parasite needs a host. Um, I've been um, fascinated both scientifically and from a literary point of view in um, extremely dangerous grizzly viruses that could have a potentially huge impact on the well-being of all of us and our, our future. Um, the Ebola virus is one such emerging infectious disease. Um, in recent decades, we have seen um, an increasing number of outbreaks of lethal viruses coming seemingly out of nowhere, but in fact emerging from nature. Um, in the last 13 outbreaks of uh, infectious disease, um, of new infectious diseases, 12 of them have come from animals. And what happens is that one of the most, um, one of the most valuable characteristics of a virus for its own long-term survival in an ecosystem is its ability to move from one host to another. And Ebola virus does this occasionally. Ebola lives somewhere in the tropical ecosystems of Central and West Africa. We don't really know where. And we don't know what kind of living thing it ordinarily dwells in and cycles in. Uh, it may be a butterfly, it may be a bat, it may be a rodent, or it may be a really tiny arthropod, such as a mite, that you can barely see with the naked eye. We don't know where o Ebola lives in nature. It probably doesn't make its own original host very sick. But when it gets into human beings, um, it makes the trans-species jump. Um, it, like, like all of these organisms, when they move into a new host, um, they can cause an absolutely devastating disease in the new host because the new host's immune system uh, isn't educated, has never encountered this life form before, and has no defenses against it. Um, one of the types of Ebola virus um, has been associated with a cave in East Africa, Kitum Cave, uh, at about 7,000 feet on the slopes of Mount Elgon, an extinct volcano. Um, I went to Kitum Cave um, in the course of researching a book about Ebola virus. Um, the cave is used by elephants and many other species of animals that go in at night to gather salt. Uh, the thing about Kitum Cave is that it's an ecosystem. And when you go inside the cave, the, the, the cave is paved with animal dung. Elephants go in at night, but not just elephants, but all other kinds of animals and all the parasites that live on these animals. And then there are bat roosts, bat colonies of various species of bats. And all these things carry parasites. Every living thing on the planet has parasites on it and in it. Um, and viruses are ubiquitous in nature. We don't even know within an order of magnitude how many species of life there are on the planet. But every one of them, maybe 10 million, nobody really knows, but every one of them has viruses in it. And these viruses have always the potential to move to a new host. So you have this cave, this environment, where there are tremendously, there's a huge 
a, a ver there's a kind of a huge amount of biodiversity inside the cave. Something in the cave carries Ebola virus. We don't know what, but we do know that people who have been in there have gotten dreadfully sick. Um, Ebola is a kind of case study. It's an example of an emerging infectious virus that's coming out of um, presumably disturbed tropical ecosystems and discovering the human species. Our numbers have increased vastly on the planet. In just the 20th century, our numbers went from one and a half billion to six billion. We're now approaching seven billion. And even more important than that is the phenomenon of packing into cities. We are becoming more and more urbanized. The year 2008 marks a watershed. Now, uh, more than half of the population of the Earth lives in an urban environment now. There's a packing factor. And in, also, in the developing world, we're seeing the appearance of these giant tropical super cities, huge agglomerations of people. Uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh is projected to have something like 30 to 35 million people living in it. And we may think that we're safe in the developed world, but I would point out that according to the United Nations statistics, Canada, the human population of Canada is close to 80% urban. Um, the same is true in the United States. Um, Canada, despite its vast open spaces, is largely an urban population. Viruses are the smallest li living things on the planet. These redwood trees are the largest individual living things in nature and also the tallest. They range in height up to 380 feet tall, 38 stories tall. They would not be out of place if they were planted in midtown Manhattan. North American forests have been devastated by wave after wave of diseases sweeping through the trees like Ebola's of their own. In 1925, um, a lady in Richmond, Virginia, brought in some branches of hemlocks from Japan. They contained a small parasite called the hemlock woolly adelgid. It jumped species. It made a trans-species jump, and it went from the Japanese plants to American hemlocks that had no uh, resistance to them. Uh, and it has the same effect on these trees that Ebola has on, on human beings. And it is, in fact, an invasive species species crossing boundary lines. As the human population grows, as we move from place to place, we bring things with us. We can bring parasites in our own bodies. Um, a, a, a rainforest virus that lives in, in the rainforests of Borneo or Central Africa can get to us within 24 hours on an airplane, traveling in a human. But the same is true for all other life forms on Earth that suffer from parasites. Um, this little thing uh, travels on the feet of migrating songbirds as they move north from their wintering grounds in the Caribbean. Um, and it has begun to wipe out the hemlocks. In Great Smoky Mountains National Park in the United States, um, down in the uh, southern Appalachian Mountains, this parasite has completely wiped out the forests. And when I went climbing with a scientist there, um, we got up into a forest canopy that had never been explored by humans, never seen by human eyes before, undoubtedly contained or d had contained species of life that were unknown to science, and everything was dead. It was, like a, uh, it was like a bleached coral reef in the air. It has had a devastating impact on the ecosystem uh, of, the of the hemlock forests. Everywhere we looked, we saw nothing but death. And, and so an emerging parasite, which is crossing boundaries, um, moving from one ecosystem to another has not just killed the hemlock trees, but has killed a profusion of biodiversity of all kinds of living things that depend on the hemlocks and are part of the hemlock habitat, including a number of different species of migrating songbirds that nest in hemlock trees. They now have nowhere to nest and nowhere to feed. No one knows what's going to happen to the Blackburnian warbler and a number of other beautiful um, songbirds that we know, that we're familiar with. Um, from the top of a hemlock, we could look out, and as far as the eye could see, this is the American National Park. This is Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It has more visitors per year than any other national park in the US, more than the Grand Canyon, more than Yellowstone and it was dead as far as the eye could see. This has, for some reason, this has not been reported in the national or international news media. I have no idea why. It's the wipeout of a rainforest ecosystem. L 
Did we even know? Could we know? It, it's true that in the southern Appalachians, these hemlock trees were in a rainforest ecosystem where they were getting 100 inches of rain a year, and it had the kind of biodiversity that you can only see in a rainforest, now gone. And finally, I think about the human population of the Earth when I think about these trees. And I think about how um, we are a part of the fabric of nature. And, um, you know, unlike the forests, we can move. We have technology. We have resources and tools to protect ourselves against emerging infectious diseases, even when the trees do not. But at the same time, there is a biological similarity. We are as vulnerable as the trees to infectious outbreaks of new things coming out of nowhere, getting into the human species. And it's happening because of a worldwide homogenization of the biosphere. As the human population expands, as we move from place to place, we, we, we cause holes in the walls that separate various ecosystems, and things leak through the holes. And I don't believe that a, vi a virus is going to come along and wipe us all out the way it would in a, a really good Hollywood movie. Um, but I do foresee stormy biological weather ahead. And I think we have to be prepared for it. I think we have to be sure that public health authorities have the funding and the kind of public support that they need to institute very good disease surveillance systems and networks so that we can at least know what's coming out of nature. And finally, we need to move forward with biotechnology, and in particular, we need to work on advanced technologies for vaccines. Uh, this can be done at the government and at the private level. Thank you very much. had a chance to read uh, Richard's bio in the program book. You may have noticed that as a result of his work and scientific contributions, there's an asteroid that's named after him. It's a huge ball of rock three miles across. And according to the bio, sooner or later it's going to slam into Mars. But what if they're wrong?